Many countries are ditching COVID-19 mass mandates, but med medical experts are concerned because the number of cases are slowly going up. Hello, I'm Mike Walter, sitting in Prana Naidu, and this is The Heat. This week, a U.S. federal judge struck down the mask mandate for planes and other forms of public transportation. Airlines quickly complied, allowing passengers to travel without masks. Spain ended its indoor mask rule after two years, and Israel will do the same this weekend. Brazil has also relaxed protocols and is holding its first and famous carnival for the first time in two years. But medical experts are concerned with the Omicron subvariant. Here in the United States, cases are rising after a two-month decline, causing many to ask, is it too soon to lower our guard? To help us answer that question, we have Dr. William Hazeltine. He's the chair and president of Access Health International and author of Omicron, From Pandemic to Endemic. Bill, um, what was your reaction when you heard this federal judge ruling, uh, a 59-page ruling striking down the mask mandate from Florida? I was uh, very concerned. Uh, I follow variants, as you probably know, pretty closely. And I'm watching the new variants of Omicron, the sons of Omicron, the daughters of Omicron, uh, begin to rise uh, in many parts of the world, not all parts yet, uh, and not quickly, but rise seemingly inexorably. Ditching the mask mandate, I think, can only speed that rise. Yeah, so what states here in the United States will you be watching as these infections start to spread? Well, the typical pattern in the U.S. is it starts first in the northeast, then it jumps over to the west coast, sometimes to the northwest as well, uh, then to the Midwest and south. And that's been the pattern for the last uh, two years through five successive waves of uh, the pandemic. Uh, this one doesn't look nearly as abrupt as the onset of Omicron in December and uh, January, but it is certainly something to watch. Underlying this is the short period of time that either pr prior infection or vaccines um, are, are effective in preventing infection. They don't last very long. It would seem three to four months at the outset, and at the end of that period, the virus has an opportunity to reinfect without changing, and if it does change, which it is changing, to reinfect all that, all, all the, all the better. And anecdotally, uh, I just heard from somebody today who said uh, they, they know someone who had uh, the shots, uh, didn't get the booster, really had a tough go of it. Should we start looking at what's fully vaxxed differently? I mean, now you could have three shots, you could have four shots, but people keep saying, "Oh, I got the two shots, I'm vaxxed." But, but is that the case? Well, I think we now know that the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines are three-dose vaccines. The difference is about tenfold in terms of short-term protection. But the difference is much greater than that in terms of protection from serious disease. If you have three shots, you are about 90 percent protected from serious disease for probably at least a year and possibly longer. That means it's a very, very good idea to get the three shots and then the fourth shot. And the fourth shot drops that even lower. That 10% drops to another 75% protection with four shots. Um, and so against serious disease, not just against infection, against serious disease, which is what most of us are really concerned about. Sure, we can stand a cold, but we don't want to get serious disease. Protection. Uh, that brings up the mask question. Uh, if you were to have a conversation with somebody, they were going to travel, get on a plane or a train, would you say, hey, I'd still wear the mask? I mean, what's your suggestion to people watching this? Well, if you're going to take a train or a plane, I'd now say double mask. I'd say that because these viruses, to give you a, a rough rule of thumb, whereas Wuhan might infect 1.2 uh, people, not two or three, this current one will infect up to 12 people. It's much, much more infectious. And so if people aren't generally wearing masks, the only thing you can do is try to protect yourself. And that means wearing at least one, and I would say two masks at this point. 
if you are planning to be with a large group of people whom you don't need. No, that means a crowd, that means a bar, uh, that means a plane, uh, a train, a bus, et cetera. Let me ask you about this. Bloomberg was out with a piece headline, Biden team waivers on fight over mass after court setback. And the concern was, you know, do we want this to go all the way to the Supreme Court and then kind of handcuff the CDC in the future? And yet late today, it looks like the CDC is going to ask the Justice Department to, pr to pursue this in terms of an appeal. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Because it seems as though the Supreme Court is tilted very much to the right. There is the possibility that they could handcuff the CDC moving forward. Well, I think that's a very serious issue. In fact, it's a broader issue that uh, going back to very ancient times, Roman law, which is the foundation of much law around the world, was that public health is the greatest good. It's that all other laws must give way, all other rights must give way to public health. That has been an operating assumption from the creation of quarantines to isolation of people who are ill and depriving them of other rights that they would normally have. And in this pandemic, we've seen the legal ability to enforce that ancient principle of protection of societies itself erode. The latest example is this mask, but also there have been many other cases. So I think that we are emerging from COVID-19 in a much weaker position to protect ourselves from future pandemics, which will surely come. Yeah, speaking of uh, which, your book, of course, Omicron from Pandemic to Endemic, is that where we are now if we entered the endemic phase? And do people really understand what endemic is? Well, we've entered the endemic phase is it because COVID is here to stay. Pandemic means it sweeps through and is gone. That hasn't happened with flu, and now it's not going to happen, I think, with COVID-19. We know enough about it to know that it's here, it keeps changing, and we've infected not just our human population, we've infected broad swaths of the animals we live with. Mice, deer, dogs, cats. I could make a very long list of the other animals that we've now infected. It comes not just from bats anymore, we get back and forth. We know now that mink, we give it to the mink, the mink give it back to us. We are now living in a, a new world in which COVID-19, this particular coronavirus, is, is here to stay. Now, endemic doesn't mean mild. Tuberculosis is endemic and still kills. Malaria is endemic and still kills. They don't get more mild. So there's no guarantee. All endemic means is it's here to stay. The severity will depend on are we vaccinated, how this virus relates to that vaccination, and are we vulnerable? Are we older? Are we o overweight? Do we have diabetes? Do we have other immune deficiencies? Are we being tr treated for cancer? There are many other factors that go into vulnerability. And the virus is a combination between what this virus can and will do and how it changes, as it's always going to be with us, and who we are and how we behave. Bill, I've kind of asked you about measuring uh, this latest outbreak. I mean, you, you're talking about how infectious it is, but, but we've seen in Shanghai a large number of people who are asymptomatic. In other words, they're walking around, they have no idea they have it. They're, it's spreading like wildfire. As you said, it's very easy to spread. How much of a concern is that here in the United States as well? It's a, a pretty big concern because in addition to the short-term consequences of COVID, uh, there are the long-term consequences. It's called long COVID or post-acute sequela of COVID past. And we're now realizing that there are many, many long-term consequences. It can affect the way you think and the way your brain is. It can age your brain about 10 years, as people have found. If you look at somebody who's mentally confused after COVID three or four months later, it looks as if they have Alzheimer's. They don't, but it looks as in their blood as if they might. It can affect your heart, your kidneys, your pancreas. Uh, and of course, it's characterized by fatigue. As many, and there's some debate about this, 30 to 30 per, 10 to 30 percent of people might suffer from long COVID. And so when 100 million Americans are likely to have been infected at this point, at least, 
That's a lot of people. And we have to take long COVID very seriously. You know, it's very hard for people to understand that like chronic fatigue syndrome is what it is. It's hard for doctors to treat it. They don't have a, a simple measure that says, yes, you have chronic fatigue syndrome. But those people who have it are really disabled. And it's something to contend with because you don't have to get sick to get long COVID. You don't even have to know you've had COVID to get long COVID. So we are now dealing with a, a new unknown that's going to be with us for a long time. So not only is the virus endemic, but the long-term effects of what's already happened are going to be serious. Bill, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much for your insights. Well, I wish I could be more cheerful. <laughs> I wish you could too, but at least you're being honest and that's what we need right now. Well, to continue our conversation, let's bring in our panel from Los Angeles. Ryan Patel is a global business executive and senior fellow with Drucker School of Management at Claremont Graduate University. From Boston, Dr. Yanir Barham is president of the New England Complex Systems Institute. And from Shanghai, Joseph Gregory Mahoney is a professor of politics at East Central China Normal University and a former public health officer with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Joseph, let's start with you. You're there in Shanghai, China's most populous city, also facing this uh, lockdown. Give us a, a, a thumbnail sketch of what it looks like in Shanghai these days. Well, you know, when you're locked down, it's really hard to, to see much beyond what you see in media. You know, uh, I can see outside my window. We go out for tests periodically. Um, but, you know, and, and when you're watching it through media, there, there, there are two uh, uh, or three types of sources. There's the official source, which uh, I find generally reliable. Uh, and then we have a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, complaining and, and uh, horror stories and, and popular media that uh, go viral. Um, uh, all the time. Uh, and then we have uh, a number of uh, uh, semi-official uh, um, posts, that uh, some of which turn out to be true, um, uh, things that are leaking. So we, we, we have the, the very personal individual experience. Uh, in my case, that's been um, not too bad, other, other than the fact that uh, uh, I don't like, and most people don't like being locked down, plenty of food, plenty of uh, essential um, uh, products needed to survive, can work online, these sorts of things. Uh, but we're also well aware that other people have struggled under these uh, conditions. Um, we, we know that, um, that people uh, struggle anyway in a city of this size, but, uh, and that anyone who's struggling now, is, 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 is this is being uh, rightly or wrongly blamed on, on the lockdown. I think one of the things that, that we have to, to look at, though, is although we see in media uh, a lot of the negativities associated with the lockdown, uh, we don't talk very much about the extraordinary uh, achievements uh, associated with it. You know, there were, before it started, there were people saying that it was impossible to lock down a city this size, that it was impossible to get the cases under control uh, with Omicron. And uh, we know that uh, that, uh, that hasn't been the case, that we have seen uh, three days of declines overall and uh, some expectations that we might uh, have um, uh, stopped community spread uh, within the next week. Any idea when you're going to be able to get out and take a nice little stroll anytime soon? Well, so I have friends who are already uh, released uh, that are that are able to move around. Um, uh, they tend to live not in larger um, uh, communities uh, or compounds with multiple buildings. They tend to live in, live in standalone buildings, um, and uh, as a result, uh, they don't have. In, in those cases, they don't have any positives in their building, and uh, they've already gone through um, uh, the period to, to demonstrate that they don't have cases, and they're out moving around. Um, that number is slowly creeping up, but uh, there's some indication from semi-official sources that uh, perhaps around April 24th, we might see uh, a large part of Shanghai reverting to the uh, previous uh, model of control, which is when we have cases and buildings, those specific buildings are locked down but the broader community will be able to move more freely. Well, Ryan, Shanghai is very important for China's economy as well as the world economy. Uh, the COVID cases are going down somewhat. Uh, companies now resuming activity. Let's take a look at uh, one story. This black Roe was the first vehicle to roll off Sai Kalingang factory's assembly line during its stress test for work resumption. The factory has adopted a single shift work system and the distance between workers on the assembly line has been increased. 
Environmental disinfection protocols have also been implemented, covering production areas, material storage spaces, and living areas. Syke has also been working hard to improve the safety and efficiency of its supply chain and logistics to better support the resumption of production. So far, we have spoken to nearly 400 suppliers and achieved in-depth information on their capacity, stock, and sourcing of raw materials. We are also paying close attention to the employee and production conditions of sub-suppliers and offering them support for resuming work. In addition, we have been contacting government departments to get permits for interprovincial green channels as soon as possible. The Tesla Gigafactory, which is also located in Lingan area, has also officially resumed operations, with 8,000 employees returning to their positions. Production lines for batteries and motors have reached full capacity, and vehicle assembly is also recovering. We will gradually increase our production capacity in the next three to four days, until we reach full capacity for a single shift. Employees at the Tesla plant are taking antigen tests every morning and PCR tests every evening, and production and office areas are disinfected on a daily basis. Lei Shuran, ICS for CGTN, Shanghai. So, Ryan, as you see a gradual increase there, China just announced its GDP for the first quarter, a growth of 4.8 percent. But you're looking at COVID and you're looking at, uh, you know, things kind of grinding to a standstill. Kind of give me your sense of, of how that number changes with uh, COVID still out there uh, disrupting things. Well, one, you got to make the analysis of what is going on right now. The busiest port in the world, Shanghai, right? And so ensuring that the imports and exports continue to go will dictate and showcase, you know, how that recovery comes back. I think you just mentioned in the clip before, we're talking about full capacity, right? It's really, really important when there is a standstill um, or a lockdown as of right now, how that affects the recovery process. So I think from two years ago, I would say that, you know, many countries would be behind in catching up to the full recovery process in producing. And it seems like from the clip that you just placed, that you played, that many of these manufacturing companies are gearing up. And so what that shows to me is hope that if we can get out of the lockdown and quickly transition to the production, that many companies and consumers will be ready for that. And that will help the recovery go quicker. But you and I both know IMF just came out and cut their global growth down to 3.6%. And so that just takes the global economy back a little bit. But obviously, China's economy is very going to be very important um, in the whole growth of the economy to come back with not only their public health, but also their goods. You know, you're, uh, I was talking to Bill, of course, about the mass mandate uh, being eased here in the United States, but we're seeing that elsewhere. Uh, Spain, Brazil, Israel uh, joining as well. What's your view on, on these, uh, you know, relaxations in terms of mass mandates? I think the, the first and most important thing is that it's still not understood the extent of the damage from long COVID, the long-term effects of the COVID infections. And, and people are, are not being informed about it means that they're not concerned about the brain damage, the heart damage, and the cardiovascular damage more generally. Um, and, and because of that, they're looking for the opportunity to relax restrictions instead of looking for the opportunity to, to, to not get infected. And, and that's super important, especially uh, one of the things that wasn't mentioned earlier is that even cases that are breakthrough cases, um, uh, it's not just the mild and asymptomatic cases that get long COVID if you're not vaccinated, but also if you're vaccinated. Um, there is a, there's some reduction, um, but it's not, uh, it, it's, it's not a huge reduction in the, in the effect of the, as far as we know, in the long COVID percentage. And, and that really means that we're, we're seeing a lot of people that are being disabled uh, by being infected. And, and the, the more subtle, quote, subtle effects of, of brain damage and heart damage and so on are, are not so subtle if you're experiencing them. And, and that information is not getting uh, to people. And so, so that's one of the key things. The, uh, I, I would add one more thing, which is that we keep thinking about this as a problem of a disease. So we talked earlier about it being endemic, but it's really about now a technology adoption problem. 
right? If we adopt better masks, if we include uh, air filtering, HEPA filtering of air, um, if we if we do the kind of testing, the twice per day testing that China is doing, or even once per day PCR or lamp testing, which is much cheaper, uh, we can actually control this uh, pandemic. And so, rather than thinking about it's a it's individuals versus the virus, if we think about it as a the virus is evolving biologically. But our society can evolve technologically and can compete with a virus and win. And it's really about technology adoption now and not about the situation that we had at the beginning where we had uh, very few tools that we had to fight the disease. Yeah. Well, uh, Joseph, let me ask you about this, because you really have uh, uh, dueling strategies. I mean, when you look at China, it's a zero COVID policy. But then you look in the United States and and it's a very laissez faire. It started out with follow the science, listen to the scientists. And uh, now it's kind of policy people saying, you know, let's get rid of these masks. Let's forget about this. You know, uh, just go about your business. I even had somebody come up to me the other day and say, well, we should just all get COVID and get it over with. Uh, it kind of, it's kind of throwing in the towel kind of attitude. I want to get your perspective there in China as you watch this playing out in other parts of the world. Well, the first thing is ju just to, to uh, go back to the, the, the point that uh, was, was being made. Um, you know, there was a, a recent uh, paper published, I believe it was in Nature, but I, I don't want to, to say that because I've read so many recently, but um, that, that the main organ that's attacked by COVID is not the lungs, as most people perceive, but the brain. And we're just starting to figure that out. We don't know what the long-term implications are. We don't even know what they are for asymptomatic cases. So uh, this is something that uh, can affect children, um, um, uh, people of all age groups. Um, so that's a major concern. And I think Chinese officials are aware of that. Now, uh, separately, I have uh, written a paper that's under review with a peer review peer peer-reviewed journal currently, in which I argue that uh, what distinguishes China uh, from other countries uh, right now is the extent to which it has evolved as a technological society. And, I, and by this, I don't mean that it's necessarily at the forefront of um, all technologies, but the way it functions technologically, the way it implements and solves problems, not just with, with tools and devices. We all have our our phones that allow us to use apps here that, that give us access or, or allow us to see the reports of our test um, that, that, that show whether or not it's safe for us to travel uh, on an individual basis that can be used for contact tracing. All these things are working in tandem with a state system as well as a population that uh, support uh, controlling the disease. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone likes it or uh, uh, particularly uh, enjoys when when they themselves are, are faced with with downtime or quarantine, but that's what's happening here. I think that there's a a very uh, a progressive uh, movement forward, uh, whereas we're seeing a resistance uh, to this uh, in the West. You know, Joseph, there was this article in the Wall Street Journal that says uh, betting on China's supply chain is a risky business because of its zero COVID policy and lockdowns to protect the population. But as you pointed out, China's done a pretty good job of actually kind of strangling uh, the virus. Is this a fair criticism? I think I think the, the first thing we have to remember is that if we look at the past two or three years, uh, what other major country has outperformed China in terms of controlling this thing, and what other country has contributed more to the global uh, supply chain than China, right? I mean, it was China's quick recovery that has been uh, supplying much of the world's supply chain over the past couple of years. And I, I think there's this, you know, perception that all of a sudden uh, Chinese officials became stupid or uh, incapable in terms of uh, the policies that we have now with Omicron. And I, I just can't understand how we reconcile um, these two different uh, uh, perspectives. Uh, but uh, as was noted, you know, we have factories restarting um, and uh, uh, some ind indications that supply chain will start to move forward. The larger question, however, and it's, it's one that is being struggled with here, is what comes next? How do we, how do we transition? And, uh, you know, there, there have been some discussions in the local business community that will be emerging from lockdown sometime in May to mid-May. And um, but we may have successive waves, four to five successive waves 
uh, over the rest of the year, which may see periodic lockdowns or partial lockdowns, which can also affect supply chain. Yeah. Um, now, the, the government will put people over profits, but they, they do want to maintain and support the economy. So yeah. it's going to be a push-pull. Well, Ryan, inflation in the United States is going up. We're seeing high numbers there. Is that being fueled by the pandemic? Is, is that a major part of the problem, you think? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, part of this whole conversation about COVID policy, the U.S. pretty much has now finally kind of all opened up, if you want to say that, in in, ma in major capitals. And with inflation rising, too, it, it provides that pressure or maybe that backdrop that these decisions of going to lockdown again, should there be another wave here in the U.S., and putting these policies in place for many of the puts you know who it puts it down to mike it puts the corporations right in the middle of this and how to deal with these policies what to do with their employees how to manage their cash flow you know are they recruiting more people how are they paying for more of that the bottom line so it does all of a sudden start to not say put the brakes but makes you rethink about what are what the companies need to be going forward and they may not always be in tandem with maybe some of the policies. So it'd be really interesting to see um, what the fiscal policy will be and how these companies go and put themselves in position to stay, not just survive, but to thrive somehow in the midst of this. You know, here in the Americas, uh, we're seeing Brazil celebrating the first carnival in two years. Uh, as we talked about, uh, the mass mandates being erased, COVID testing seeming to going away. Uh, is this the new normal and is it a good thing? I really think that the main thing that we need to focus on is, is helping people understand that they have the ability to make a difference in their own health, um, that, we, that people cannot rely on governments right now. I mean, again, there are few exceptions, and China, of course, is demonstrating that the government does do everything to control the virus, but in other places, it has become a responsibility of individuals, families, and ultimately, it, by necessity, communities. And, and companies can play a huge role in this. Um, and, and there's been a lot of discussion about the idea that, given the lack of reliability of the government, that having companies um, uh, declare their uh, actions uh, to control the virus for their employees, for their customers um, will really have a big impact because a lot of the public are not happy about the relaxation of restrictions. Uh, it's really coming from a very particular part of the business community and, and surely not being supported by a majority of the public. All right, but well, we're gonna have to, I'm sorry I have to interrupt, but we're gonna have to leave it there. We've run out of time, but it was a great discussion. I wanna thank all of you for joining us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Mike Waldner, Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for being with us.